Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 to 16, hear the word of the Lord. When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, because they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, because your Father knows the things you need before you ask them. Therefore, you should pray like this. A Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debts. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their offenses, the heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses. Father in heaven, we come again to some passage familiar to our ears and perhaps even to our hearts. And so we would ask that you would protect us from over familiarity and speak to us in breath of your word. Remind our minds today. Perhaps, Lord God, you would remind us of something that we already know, but perhaps have forgotten. Or perhaps in your word that today you would spur us on to cause our practice to match our knowledge. Or perhaps you would show us something new that is not yet seen before in your word. However you would do it, we lay our hearts open before you and ask that you would stir in us a deep desire to draw near to your throne of grace. That we might behold our Father's face to know you and love you always. So be at work in our midst of grace in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today, a popular online prayer of my learning platform has captured the attention of many millions around the world, and it's called Master Class. And the slogan is really simple. Learn from the best, be your best. And it's really a, a smart idea, uh, but a simple idea. Uh, if you want to learn something, you ought to learn from an expert in the field. And so this website offers all kinds of opportunities to learn from a master. Right? Learn to shoot a basketball from NBA champion and substitute Jack Curry. Learn how to write a song with Grammy Award winner Alicia Keys. Learn how to act with Oscar winner Natalie Portman. Learn how to win big in business with billionaire entrepreneur Mark Cuban. And so on. Now, just to be clear, as a caveat, I am in no way endorsing the platform or any of the classes this morning. But I do think that that concept of nonsense is true and helpful for us. As you see in our passage, we get a free master class from the true master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke's account tells us this teaching was prompted by a question. Having witnessed from afar the Lord Jesus praying in a certain place to his Father, one of Jesus' disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. Of course, then in this passage, we're going to hear that request from his people to each other. There are many books they can give out. We get all kinds of books on prayer today, can't we? And many of them are very good. But wouldn't you rather learn from the Master himself? It's my desire that by studying this prayer may Master faith that the Lord Jesus our Master would be teaching us the people how to pray. And if that is your heart's desire, right, you come to him and say, Lord, teach us to pray, teach me to pray. That he may well direct you to his will and the things on the mouth that we find recorded here. Here is our Lord's instructions on prayer. Now, certainly he gave other instructions on prayer, as we see later in the sermon, Matthew chapter 7. But in this, we have a model prayer that he gave us, and he said, You should pray like this. This is Jesus' master class on prayer. And your friends, this is a subject of which we need ongoing. Continue, continuing in education. As right, God's people, we never graduate from teaching the need of his grace. Uh, we never grow out of it. We are always in need of hearing from him in his word, and we never outgrow our need to be a people of prayer. And God's people, people are always to be a praying people. Whether it's the first prayer that we pray when God opened our eyes to see the gospel and to believe upon Christ, or whether it's the prayer right before we close our eyes to go to that land, where that we will be faced no more and see our Lord face to face. God's people are to always be praying people, basically, as it were, the heart to be of the Christian life. And because prayer is so important, we need to relearn and revisit this master class in Jesus again and again and again, teaching my people to pray. So what we're going to be 
be doing this morning is spending our time studying a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Matthew 16, Matthew 16. And the big idea of this passage is really that Jesus teaches his disciples a pattern for prayer to our Father in heaven that seeks his glory and our good. Now, if you were with us last week, you'll remember that this prayer that we're going to look at is part of a larger uh, passage of what is to guard our hearts from the temptation to do what we do for the praise of people rather than for the pleasure of God. Now, we talked about you know, how oftentimes religious things that we do, even good and necessary things, uh, that can kind of become silly, as it were, because people see us and they think well of us because we look a certain way. Jesus knows it's not what it's about. Rather, prayer is something where we humbly draw before God, we cry out to Him for what pleases Him. And that makes us more like Him. And so Jesus lays out here for us a model prayer that pleases us to God to help us to know how to pray. And so before we get into this, I think it's important to recognize that faithful Christians have studied and taken and enrolled in this master class before. And some of their teaching is helpfully summarized in the Baptist Catechism which is a set of questions and answers designed to summarize and explain the four doctrines of our faith. And I've included some of those Q and A's on the Lord's Prayer on the Office of Science and Sermon Outline. So we're going to look at this and unpack it together, but I encourage you to take that book at home with you and study it later today. Throughout this week with your family, maybe walk through a particular day and study what others have taught about this prayer. So let's begin our time this morning by noticing the extreme preface of the prayer. And here we're going to talk about two kind of introductory questions. And they are, what is prayer? And who is it that we pray to? So first, what is prayer? Prayer is, very simply, communication to God. It is when we intentionally communicate to Him what we think, what we feel, what we hope, what we fear, what we dream about, what we think about, what our struggles are, things that we regret, things that we've committed, things we love, and things... We hate when we bring all of those things up to Him. And with that in mind, we need to make some important clarifications when we talk about prayer as communication to God. So, first of all, right, this communication is not informing God, but transforming us. Just look at what Jesus says in verse 7, right before they begin to pray. He says, When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, because they imagine what we heard for their many words. So we need to understand what we're praying. We need to think. Prayer is not just an act of the heart, it's an act of the mind. And we just think a prayer really quickly, and thinking about it, and then there's a conversation. So maybe you don't babble the Lord's Prayer, maybe you really do think carefully about what you're saying to God. But maybe you babble other prayers, like the prayer right before dinner, and you think of the same every time. And I won't say what it is, but maybe a prayer like that. And there shouldn't be this kind of babbling in prayer. It should be thought. About what you're saying, you should think about to whom we're talking. Jesus said, "You shouldn't be like pagans keeping up words and empty words." So really, it has nothing to do with many or few words. It has to do with our hearts. Jesus said, "You should understand who you're talking to. You should tell God has been spoken to you, and that's how you should pray." Paul said in Romans 12 verse 2, "Be transformed by the renewing of your mind." So then Jesus says in verse 8, "Don't be like them." Because your father knows the things you need before you ask him. Right? So don't ever think that you're bringing some new information to God. Right? Maybe he overlooked it. You're drawn into this repentance. You know, oh God, you've probably been so busy running this universe that you haven't yet noticed that I got this little problem here. So I just want to talk to you about it. If you have time, I'll just kind of think. And that's a limitation of God. He already knows, Jesus said. He, he knows what you need before you ask him. So never suppose that you're pulling in God on something that He didn't know. Prayer is not about informing God, it's about transforming Him. Second, this communication is not listening to God, but talking to God. And many think of prayer as being kind of a two way deal where I pray to God, and then I hear back from God. And I would like to caution us against that understanding of prayer. And the reason is, the reason is because nowhere in the Bible, by teaching or example, uh, does it say that God speaking to us is called prayer? Now, God does speak to us in the Old Testament, all the way through prophets, sometimes directly. In the last days, He spoke to His Son, and now, to us, He speaks to us in this Word. But 
that's not God praying. That's not God talking to us in prayer to speak to us in this way. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't need to make the prayer. I don't know who it is that the Spirit is alive and well. And God's people, that He can bring Scripture to mind, that He can move in our hearts. And all those kinds of things while we're praying. That is true. But when we look at the Scripture, we see that prayer isn't us listening and waiting for God to speak to us and send a sign for us to do. And that's not the expectation. But rather, it is us coming to Him and crying out to Him and talking to Him. So basically, prayer is our communication to God. God talks to us with His Word, and we talk to Him with His prayer. And thirdly, this particular prayer is not in any trust can't, but it models the following. This, pattern, this prayer is designed to be a pattern for our prayer. It's not ultimately meant to be a prayer that we can simply repeat by rote or routine. Now, it is perfectly appropriate for us to repeat it academically, but it doesn't directly give us a rubric for our prayer for our worship. But each petition that Christ gives us in this prayer is really ultimately suggestive of a whole range of incorporated petitions that we can bring to the Lord. Prayer focuses on the worship of the Father, the kingdom of the Father, and the will of the Father, and the provision of the Father, and the grace of the Father, and the protection of the Father. And in all of those categories, we provide you hundreds of ideas of how you might pray appropriately to the Lord. So the teacher says, therefore, you should pray like this, not giving us a name for us, and then model the Father. Second question. Who do we pray to? Notice there in verse 9, when we pray, we pray to our Father in heaven. And in that little phrase, there are some profound truths about what God is doing in prayer. First, it speaks of this authority. Our Father is the King of heaven. Meaning, He's above us. He's distinct from us. He's unlike us. In many ways, He's separate from us. He's greater than us. He is outside of time and space. It is true that God is present everywhere at all times. That is true. But we must think of Him rightly as the King of Heaven. And that's His throne in the realm of eternity. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were born, before He gave birth to the earth and the world, from eternity to eternity, you are God. God is different. He's high, transcendent, lifted up, but he, he's beyond us. Now, a lot of people leave God there and think he's some kind of absentee landlord who made the world and set it, set it straight and said, Good luck, peace out, see you in eternity. But that's not who he is. He is transcendent, he is in heaven, and he is involved. And Psalm 115 3 says, Our God is in heaven, and he does whatever he and so this is the exalted side of God, the, the majestic side of God. He's high and lifted up. He's exalted in heaven. And our problem today is that we're too chummy with God. And we think of him as he's our pal, as a celestial bellhop waiting on our beck and call. Or Ephesians 12 says, Our God is a consuming fire. And we should worship him with reverence and reverence and awe. He's exalted in heaven. His grace is only that to him. He is our Father in heaven. The intimacy of this relationship is remarkable. This is the same intimacy that he's inviting us to right here. And this is how we should talk to God as our Father. Now, in one sense, God is the Father of everyone. Acts 17 says that we are all his offspring. He made us all. And he didn't just make us, but he also rules over us as God with this perfect balance of intimacy and authority. God the Father cares for all the people He has made. We saw in chapter 5, verse 45, that He gives us the sun and the rain and gives us air and food. He gives us good things, even to the dead. But this sense was misunderstood by liberal theologians a hundred years ago. They misunderstood what the fatherhood of God meant in the biblical sense. They thought that it taught that there was a universal fatherhood of God, meaning that He was the Father of everyone in a salvific sense. Friends, this is not liberal. God is the creator of everyone, but he's not the saving father of everyone. John 1 verse 12 says, To all who receive Christ, 
to those who believe in His name, He gave them the right to become children of God. And it's not to everyone. It's those who believe in Jesus Christ who are adopted into the family, whose faith is in Jesus' name. And those are the children of God. And for us who believe God is a compassionate Christ. Look at the Psalm 103, 13. As a father has compassion on his children, for the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. In Romans 8, Paul is like this, writing that father language when he says, You receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out of Abba, Father. The incredible dignity that has is compassion and it's wonderful. But for Jesus wants us to understand the race. It's hard not to agree with J.I. Packer when he writes this. If you want to judge, how well a person understands Christianity. Find out how much he gives to the Father through his compassion. And then to have it not be the Father. This is not the thought that prompts the control of worship and prayer in the simple outlook of life. But this is traditional understanding of human spirituality. The Father does speak to us, but he also wants us to know him. And he's a God of sweet intimacy as well as a God of supreme authority. Uses that matchless trait to care for him and to protect his children. Now, I suspect that for some of you this morning, when I speak about God being a father, you are conflicted in your heart. You may even be thinking, I know I'm supposed to like it, but I can't help it. For some of us, that bad, wicked, earthly thoughts to our heart will be their glory. Some of us had earthly thoughts. We didn't even know what compassion was. What told us in the week showed no affection. Some of us had passion fathers who were just not even there. Maybe they worked with their career and just felt them out at home. So when we hear this idea that God is Father, it kind of makes us confused. Because we know we want to like that, we're supposed to like that, but we don't know how in the world to like that. And I just want you to know this morning that Heavenly Father, very unlike the description of the Trinity in the whole Bible. He is a good father, a perfect father, a loving father. And in Christ, he isn't just my father. Verse 9 says, he is our father. For those of us who are in Christ, God is our father. We know him on a personal and a corporate level. We know a particular and unique kind of love that the world doesn't have. So we need to let the scripture tell us what kind of father he is. He's gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger, abounding in love and kindness. He's strong enough to protect you and bring you back home when you want to run. He's the father who runs and greets you while you're still away off if you're a prophet. And God himself tells you what kind of father he is. He's not like your father on earth, but he is a father in heaven. So there's that wonderful God in the scene and a story. How do we hold those two things together? He gives us, he's going to teach us this day, from both sides of it. Our Father wants us to come to him about everything, right? About big stuff and little stuff, about eternal issues and everyday issues. And this prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray is actually laid out that way. You've got two major sections in verses 9 and 10, which is prayers about eternal issues, about God's name, kingdom, and will. And then in verses 11 to 13, we see prayers about everyday issues, about a loaf of bread, about forgiveness, about temptation. So what we're going to do for the rest of our time is we're going to look at each of these. There are six things that Jesus teaches us to pray for us to repeat in these two sections. So we're going to look first about prayers regarding eternal issues. Verses 9 to 10, follow along with us. Therefore, you can pray like this. Our Father in heaven... Your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So here we find three areas where Jesus says we should always be thinking about whenever we come and we pray to God. And the unique thing about all three of these things, and we really can't see it well in our translations here, but all of them are in the third person imperative, which simply means this. Jesus is telling us to ask God to do something. Okay, so all of these are requests for God to act. God, do these things that we're about to ask for. He 
the first is, I believe, the highest priority that we could honor God's name and hold as the older generation would say, hallowed be your name. Maybe you're not familiar with that word, hallowed. Maybe you don't use that in everyday language. It's not a common word. But it means to, to reverence the name of holy. Hold it in honor. Hold it in high esteem. What is it that we should be reverencing that holy? What is it that we should hold in honor? It's the name of God. May your name be held in honor. May your name be esteemed in reverence. That's how Jesus begins this chapter 1 and 2. So the name of God is really the summing up of everything that he's revealed to us about himself. And he began at the burning bush when Moses said, What is your name? And he said, I am who I am. I am is my name. It's so existent. No one created me. No one sustains me. I just am. I always have been. I always will be. That's who I am. And then God, through the years, reveals other names to us. We have all these names. We use the word Yahweh. Or we have Yahweh Jireh, the Lord who provides. Yahweh Rapha, the, the Lord who heals. Yahweh Nisi, the Lord our banner. There are so many names. And we can reveal something of his character to us. This is the name of God. That name sums up everything we know about him. Everything that he's revealed to us in his word. We should desire that his name be exalted here on earth. That he's born of God. We find who he is. We come to faith. Right? We come to salvation through that name. The name of Jesus. To those who believe in his name. He gave them the right to be called children of God. After we believe in His name, what do we do? We call on His name. Romans ten thirteen. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What's the next step? We're baptized into His name. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The name of God is our salvation. His name is made to be held in honor. And this, this was, I believe, the consuming passion of Jesus Christ. The name of God is the Son. He died for the sake of God's name, the glory of God. John 12, he said, Father, I have brought glory to glory on earth by completing the work he gave me to do. And everything Jesus did was to glorify the Father, the name of the Father. So he said, Father, glorify my name. The Father actually said, I have glorified your name, and I will glorify your name. John is zealous for his name. He does all things for the sake of his name. The prayer that God's name would be exalted. To get rid of small thoughts about God, a tired of thinking great thoughts of God. Our God is too small in our minds to be named. So let us exalt His name together and hollow His name and see that we come with reverence. And let's proclaim His name across the nations and pray for His name to be honored by all. So the second one is the prayer that God's kingdom would come. And God your kingdom. So what is the kingdom of God? A kingdom is a realm where a king reigns over a nation. So the kingdom of God is God's kingdom, ruling in God's place over God's people. It's a basic definition. Now, is God reigns here on earth? Well, absolutely. And he reigns over the entire earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That doesn't mean that the kingdom is seen everywhere in the same way on the earth. And so to think that the kingdom is the place, if I could use that word, the place where God it's the place where God is obeyed the land. As the kingdom advances, right, there is an opposition from another kingdom. The kingdom of Satan. And Satan fights against the advance of the kingdom of God. So when we pray, your kingdom come, we are praying for Satan's kingdom to be destroyed and for God's kingdom to be established and exalted. And this means that there's a past, there's a present, and there's a future aspect to God's kingdom. The past came when Jesus first appeared. And it's Jesus' first words in the Gospel of Matthew. What were they? Repent. Why, he says. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it's, it's happening now. The kingdom came when Jesus came the first time. When he did his miracle, it was a demonstration of the kingdom's power. He said, if I drive out demons, by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Right? So the kingdom of heaven first came when Jesus entered into the world. But then, it advances. It's growing. And that brings us to the present step. How does the kingdom come today? Right? It comes when it's 
the event. It just said from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. So how does it advance? Matthew 13, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The man took and sowed it in the field. It's the smallest of all the seeds. But when grown, the tallest in the garden place, it becomes a tree. So the birds of the sky come and nest it. How is it doing that? Is it doing that through the preaching of the gospel, through evangelism, through mission? Right? Your kingdom come is a missionary church. Isn't it? It's may your kingdom spread from shore to shore. May Jesus shall reign that all people will glorify your name in all the earth. The kingdom is advancing little by little. So each of you who have come to faith in Jesus Christ, who have crossed over from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of the beloved Son, and you've made that journey by grace through faith. You've entered the kingdom. And that kingdom advanced a little bit more the day you came to faith in Christ. And who knows, but today for some of you who don't know yet Jesus, the kingdom may advance even here today in our midst. When you yield to him, when you bow your feet, when you say, Jesus, I receive you as the Lord and Savior. So the kingdom would advance to you. We pray for those who will make that in the new time. And then this is also a future aspect here as well. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 34. Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes and his second coming in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glory and throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left, and then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's the coming of the kingdom given in its fullness. And brothers and sisters, don't you yield to that now? The entire Bible ends with words about his coming in the book of Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. Then he testifies to these things, saying, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come on. Why we lost our cars and lost our homes. That's why oftentimes we just turn off the news because we can't stand to see what people do to one another anymore. And this prayer is the plea for God to intervene. It's the cry for Him to come, set up His kingdom, so that the evil will reign no more. That's why Jesus came the first time, and to die on the cross for sinners, for evildoers, to triumph over the evil one, Satan, and then rise from the dead and defeat the grave. Then he is coming back. There's a day coming, and he's going to fix everything fully and finally. And that's what Jesus says ultimately to pay for him. Kingdom come. God, we have had enough of murder and rape. God, we have had enough of slavery and human trafficking and abortion. God, we've had enough of all the lying politicians. God, we've had enough of the sin in our own hearts and all of its failed promises. God, we've buried enough loved ones. We've tried enough Jesus. How long, O Lord? God, bring us to that happy land. Bring us to that land in which there shall be no more crying or tears of death anymore. Bring that day when Christ returns and the last enemy of God is defeated. And we are saved and sin no more. God, bring your kingdom. That's what Jesus is saying. We all pray for him. What does the church of Jesus do? Because it's just that second one. It teaches us what God's kingdom is like. And we can speak it on that day. Your will be done. This is how the kingdom of heaven comes. When God's will is done on earth, just as thoroughly as it is done among the angels in heaven. Now, when we talk about the will of God, it's important to understand that we tend to talk about two aspects of God's will. God has one unified will, but there's two aspects of it. One is what we would call the decretive will, or the will that pertains to the eternal decrees of God, the eternal plans of God. 
read in the Bible that God has created things in his kingdom and power before the foundation of the world was laid. Everything that was supposed to come to pass. He decreed it. Before the first brick was laid at the beginning of creation, God had already decreed everything that had come to pass. So that decree will be done. It will absolutely be done. But no matter what we say or what we think, God's plan will come to fulfillment. But there's this other aspect of God's will, which is God's revealed will. God tells us that He wants for that high decree to be made. God's revealed will includes His law. There's still much rebellion and the world is in on the part of the people against God's law and against the law. So to pray that God's kingdom would come and that His will would be done, is to pray that God would make in my heart and in your heart that faith, that trust, and that obedience that that glorifies God. We won't reach that perfection of faith, that perfection of trust, that perfection of obedience from this side of glory. But we are praying that the kingdom of glory may be. That when that day comes, that we will serve God as fully and freely as the angels do now. And that the order that we have received from heaven be fulfilled. So that last phrase really expresses the purpose of some of our thoughts about the God on earth. How much it is in heaven? And how is God's will done in heaven? Right, so it's done fully, gladly, and immediately. What does that sound like it? All the way, right away, and not the other. Right? Anything short of those three is disobedience. The angels obey all the way. They do everything God says. A hundred percent, not ninety percent of what God says. And they do it right away. Right? Quickly they go out and do what he says. They don't procrastinate, they don't drag their feet, they just do the will of God right away. And then they do it joyfully, because they trust in their Creator, the Father. But Jesus is himself the greatest example of obedience to God. Jesus said in John 4, 34, My truth is to do the will of Him who sent me, and to finish His work. Remember, the garden of Gethsemane, the city that the cross was coming to, the last dream, the last of God. And He cries out, If there's any other way, Father, remove this cup from me. Then Jacob just says, Yes, not my will, but my will. When they finally said, We pray, Thy will be done. And I love this as well, even if the answer requires it, that my will be not done. So we can humbly and honestly and reverently come before God in word and actually show us if there's any hope or any dream or any desire or any ambition that you're holding back from God this morning. Something even right now that you know that the Father wants you to surrender. So something about which you could say, Lord, anything you want, but not that. Not here, no, please no. Is there any place in your heart that's like that? If so, I want you to know this morning that you may need that kind of posture to seek to be set free from the will of God Almighty. He is a loving and gracious God. He is a holy God. He knows what we don't know and He sees what we don't see. And even the best of things that we will not surrender or be willing to ask for that might become idols in our hearts. And so, our Father, who knows the things in our hearts, just as we think we know what we need, we see more than what God does. And we think we know what's best for us, we see more than what our Father does. The scriptures say that God is opposed to the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. So we can say, Your will be done in my heart, in my mind, in my church. Body and soul. Father, let your will be done. Let it be done. And so Jesus tells us to pray that our deeds would be eternal things to be done. So God is not just the God who cares about those glorious eternal things, He's also the one who knows that we very much today and are much that we know. So it's just all kind of a slippery lake. You get to bed, you brush your teeth, you get some coffee, you get in the car. You go to work, you get some coffee, you deliver your report, and you just do your thing. You go through life, and then you go home, and then you just do it all again. And there's a lot of mundane stuff. Cooking, cleaning, washing, lather, rinse, repeat. Okay? God cares about all of them, right? Because even in the smallest thing, our hearts know that it all comes from Him, and it's all to be done for Him. So we're going to look at the specifics of our everyday life. 
But before we do, again, look at how all it puts to be taking on. The focus is on now our needs. First, provision for present needs. Give us today a daily bread. Secondly, pardon from past sins. Forgive us our debt, but we also have forgiven our debt. And thirdly, protection from future sins. Do not lend us into temptation and deliver us from evil. And that's the way how the devil can tell us to do that. So let's look a little more carefully at each of these conditions. First, the letter says, Give us today a daily bread. So we're talking here about basic necessities. And yes, bread to some degree symbolizes everything we need. We don't really just need bread. Uh, we need this bread that we're swimming for. Uh, we need a whole realm of things, and God knows what we need before we ask. But bread as symbolizes the basic physical needs. Lots of things. Air to breathe. All these things provided as we pray and as we seek God in this matter. And we need God to give it to us. He calls us to humble dependence. But I just reminded you of the story of the flesh of a man in Exodus chapter 16. The Israelites were out in the desert, and there was no food. God knew what they needed before they asked. Right? He said, I know what you need. I will provide it for you. So they wake up the next morning, and there's men on the ground. It's like, what is this? What man is this? Like, and all they had to do was go out and collect it. But they were under strict orders that five days each of the week, they would collect only one day's ration, so there's only enough for their family for one day, and on the sixth day, collect for two days. Now, what would happen if they collected two days' worth of bread on that day? They got moldy. They got you know, worms and maggots. What would God teach you then? You have to come to me every day, and you can't store it up, all right? Day after day after day, and you don't eat it anymore. That's just saying your heart. That's the very problem we see at the end of the chapter of Matthew 6. The birds do not sow or reap or store away in barns. Well, we throw away in barns all the time. There's nothing wrong with that, but if you start trusting the barn, then you need to trust the God. And that's the problem. So this is about the humble dependence. Again, when you sit down and eat, right? Thank you, Lord. There's food here. We've seen an answer to our prayers. Give us today a baby bread. And the world focuses on daily needs, does it not? It thinks very much about daily needs, but it also thinks very much about me. About material wants and desires. And it's praying for worldly ever to pray with its selfish motives. And you can rearrange those words of the like this. Give me, give me today my daily bread, and while you're at it, give me today my daily cake. This is my luxury. This is my cheap cake to get to all I all enjoy and all the things I want. Right? Is that what this is about? But God does not promise us those luxuries. He does not promise us a comfortable, easy life. How easy it is for us to forget Genesis 3.19. Right? It's the thing that God made to Adam. You will eat bread by sweat of your brow. Till you return to the ground, for you were taken from it. For you are dust, and dust you shall return. Now, are we still under that statement? Let's be honest. We need to work hard for our daily bread. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10, If anyone isn't willing to work, he should not eat. That we should work and not be idle. In that, in the means, the ordinary means of our working hard, God provides for us and gives us the strength and the ability to work, to give us the gift of employment, the sun and the rain to grow the crops, the animals to eat, and so on. Right? It all comes from Him. And the ordinary means that He's provided. So we're not talking about luxury. We're not talking about a comfortable, easy life. We're talking about humble dependence on God for all of our basic needs. Paul says this in 1 Timothy 6. Godliness with contentment is a great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out. If we have food and clothing, we will be content with these things. Contentment comes when you're able to discern the difference between the needs and the wants. And you trust God for your needs. And for your wants, He provides. God gives you the strength, whether it's reading them or looking at your feet or your flesh. God will supply all that you need in life and comfort. Right on the next slide. Now, in this condition, in the same way, we have a different condition, and this deals with our sins. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. This is a very 
declaration of what the promise is that we saw for our children to be. Lord, if you kept the next chapter, we get to Lord, you keep the But if you say you forgive us, so that we may be forgiven. Forgive us our sins, but we don't need to forgive our sins in our sins. So this brings a couple of important things to you. Starting with our own need to be forgiven. Critical forgiveness of God. And then also a call to forgive others for God. And notice that our sin is likened to a debt. Because sin is indeed a debt to God. Because He made it. So therefore we owe Him our allegiance and our obedience and our worship and our trust. And if we do not give that, we are in debt. And it will come due on the last day. In the same image of Jesus in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus talks about the man who is forgiven a great debt. The good news of the gospel is that God delights in doing it. He loves doing it for those who repent and trust in His Son. But the price to be canceled it because Christ has paid us. And the debt that we owe to God, Jesus paid it all. And He says it is finished. By all the sins that we ever did, all the sins we will ever do, all the sins we're doing even now, forgiven, free, done, canceled, it's over. That's good news. So you can reconcile to the Father, the prayed righteousness of Christ, all accounts are settled, all debts have been paid, it's a done deal. But just because we've been forgiven, doesn't mean that we don't have a constant need to guard our hearts and to look closer at our relationship with the Lord. And one of the things that you might be as you are sharing in Christ as a believer is the fact that you confess sin all the time. Now, some of us have a sensitive conscience. Like, we can get a little bit dry about it and punishing it there so far. But it's a balance we need to be changing. It's a normal process of the Christian is to realize this flesh, I'm not ready to buy the Holy Spirit. I assume I probably messed up something somehow, somewhere. Thank God for His grace and His sweet dominion. But Lord, show me areas that I need to confess. Where are my motives wrong? Where are my attitudes wrong? And then there's one wise Christian says that as you look and forgive yourself, then you can look at your neighbor. So yes, look at your sin, then look at him. Look at him again. And rest in his mercy. And so you don't want to get knocked down. You're like, woe is me, I'm so wretched, I can't get out of bed. But you are wretched, but get out of bed because Jesus got out of the grave. Rose from the dead, you've been raised with him, and he gives you grace. We gotta get going by faith. But the reality is that to constantly be forgiven for confessing our sins and repenting and asking the Lord to forgive us. The reality is that for somebody who has been forgiven much and knows that they're forgiven much, it does something to us. And it marks us. God's grace doesn't just cancel our debt, but it also changes our heart. So we're now, when somebody else hurts us, sins against us, and confesses that sin to us, the right response is that we would forgive them. When it comes to giving sin, it's an oxymoron. I'm not saying it's not hard. And I'm not saying that some of you here right now have some really difficult wounds to forgive people. My encouragement is to read back to this week, take some time to go, and then set up a time where you can come in and talk to one of the pastors and can help you think through this. We can help you process this. So we can forgive people who aren't just forgiven by the Lord, but also people who forgive one another. This is a strong word that Jesus gives in verse 14, right after this prayer. He says, For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses. What does that mean? Have we earned forgiveness by forgiving? No, not at all. What it means is that a heart that has been changed by grace shows itself by its extending grace. And that we should desire to do so and then press into that even though it's hard. By came into the world as the great kinsman to not only to reconcile us to God, but reconcile us to one another. And that is Jesus in the light of something that takes place in the community. So I see a people who are constantly confessing and seeking for forgiveness and also extending forgiveness to others. What do you see here? 
Do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. Now, our first prayer is that you feel like a sin. Why would we need to ask the one who has been the one who's preaching to you that doesn't tempt anyone to not bring us into temptation? It's not cruel, it's helpful, but he knows the quest for protection from temptation was very cruel. And they would not have seen anything odd about this request at all. Further, the plea to our Heavenly Father is not, do not tempt us, but do not lead us, do not bring us into temptation. And then drawing on the second part of verse 16, the idea is to simply ask God not to lead us as disciples into situations in which the evil one would seek an opportunity to contain us. So this request really is a voice not cry. As Jesus could take Satan one on one in the wilderness, we cannot. And we need the Father's guidance, Savior's work, and the Spirit's strength to win the victory over the evil. And we need God for our spiritual survival. Quarrels, again, put the question to He says, The disciple is so weak that he is no match for the devil. He needs a Savior, not an assistant, a hero, not a helper. He needs a champion who will fight the evil one for him and who will snatch him from the clutches of the enemy who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. We do not do deliverance. We cannot do deliverance like that. So this is the prayer for protection from future sin. We live in a dangerous world because we have a raging foe. Did you know that you have an intelligent, personal adversary who seeks to destroy you? First Peter 5, 8 through 9 says, So reminded, be alert, your adversary, the devil, is crawling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. As Satan, your time goal is to discourage us, defile us, devour us, and kill us. So without the Lord, Guiding us through the minefield of these demonic devices, we are praying to be blessed with spiritual security. So, the prayer for deliverance from temptation and the evil one is called repentance. We pray that. This is the petition we pray at the beginning of every day. It's a prayer that you should pray throughout the day. And remember, 1 Corinthians 10 13, to pray for the deliverance of temptation. No temptation is common upon you except what is common to humanity. And he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way out, so that you will be able to stand. So pray for yourself. Pray that for our church. Right? Ask God to deliver us. But not just you, not just me. But he will deliver all of us from temptation. So Andrew Murray was a pastor. He wrote over 240 books. He had for all his people his best known work is that he was One of his best known works is With Christ is the School of Faith. Then he provides a powerful word in the form of a prayer that serves as an appropriate conclusion to the study of this book. And he writes this Lord Jesus, enroll my name among those who confess that they don't know how to pray as they should. And who especially ask you for a course of teaching in faith. Lord, teach me to be patient in your school, so that you will have time to serve me. I am ignorant of the wonderful privilege and power of faith. Believe me to forget my thoughts of what I think I know, and make me feel before you the true teachableness and poverty of spirit. Fill me, Lord, with confidence that with you for my teaching, I will learn to pray. Blessed Lord, I know. That you will put that spirit of faith to trouble me. With your grace, that spirit will continue to be with you. Father, 
that kind of prayer is not for the Bible. What you say, Lord, we need you. We are the only one. Lord Jesus, can I be reflected? Part of our prayer is that as a church, we try to be people who work to come to heaven. Based on our Lord Jesus. Who did it teach Jesus to pray like this? Our Father in heaven, your name be on this world. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. As we have also forgiven our debts. And do not bring us into temptation. 